Ciao, I'm Marianne Esposito. Today on Ciao Italia, Busiate. Today, I'm going to show you how to make a very special pasta called Busiate. And it comes right from here in Sicily, around Trapani. This is a very classic pasta, and it's made by hand. And you need to use a form of some sort. Now, this is a, the busso, or the name from which the pasta is taking, taken. So I have it in this little package here, see? I've got a variety of different sizes and thicknesses of these forms. And this was made for me by my great friend Terry Murray at artisanpastatools.com in California. So these are all hand done. But you don't need to have this kit. You can do this just using a wooden skewer. I'm recommending a wooden skewer, not a metal skewer. So first of all, you have to have the skewer. So we have that. I'm going to be using this one. So the pasta is very simple. It's made with durum flour, a very silky grind of semolina flour. Semolina is a coarser yellow flour. It's the same flour. It's coarser. But this is silkier, and it is ground again. The semolina, the, the uh, coarser grind, is ground twice to make this silky flour called durum flour. And you can buy durum flour in a bag in your grocery store. So we want two cups of the durum flour. And then, and you can do this in a food processor if you want to, but I'm going to do it on a board for you in the old classic way to do it. You want a pinch of salt, so a little salt. And you want some water. How much water? I have no idea. So we're going to start with, I have a half a cup of water here. And all you really want to do is get enough water mixed with this flour to create a ball of dough. So you have to add it gradually, because you just don't know how much water you're going to need. So the idea for this pasta, the busiate, the name, besides meaning the rod that it's formed on, is said to have come from the fact that women who were at home made this pasta and formed it around knitting needles. So the rod looks a little bit like a knitting needle. So that's where the idea came from. So you can see that now I'm starting to get something that will hold together but I need some more water. So I'm going to get some more water for this. This is all trial and error. So you pour a little bit more water on here and you just keep working this. You can see that this is a nice yellowish looking flour. And this was the flour, the grain actually. Semolina comes from a hard wheat flour. That was the grain that kept Sicily at the forefront of feeding the ancient Roman armies that came through there. So we've got to add some more water. And just work this until we have something that we like. You can see that I'm getting a ball of dough now. I'm going to push this, this excess flour away and add just a drop more water. I'm not happy with that yet. And you keep working it. And always work on a wooden board because a wooden board is going to give you some grab. You can't really do this on stainless steel or marble if you do a lot of pasta making like I do. You notice I've got a wood counter here because I need that in order to hold on to the pasta. So you see how it's now absorbed all that excess flour it could use about five more minutes of hand kneading. As I say, you can always do this in the food processor as well. So there's our ball. And now we have to allow the gluten in that to relax. 
so that we can work a little easier with it. So you want to wrap it or put it under a bowl for about 30 minutes. And here's one that we did a little earlier. And you can see the difference just in the color from this dough just relaxing a while. This is a lot softer. See how firmer this is? And this is a lot softer. So we put this on some flour with a bowl over the top. And now we can work with this. But first I want to get this excess flour out of the way. Okay. All right, so how do we form the busiate? Well, let me show you. Think of a twisted pasta. It may take you a few times to get it, but it's worth it. And I know what you're saying, who is going to make this? Well, you know, it's a tradition, and I like to keep the traditions alive. So you start by just pinching off a small piece, see, like that. Set the rest aside. You work with it in small little pieces. And then, on a lightly floured board, you just start to roll it into a rope shape under the palm of your hand. Now, if we had tried to do this with this dough, we wouldn't be able to do very much because the gluten had not been relaxed enough. But here, we are able to stretch the dough, you see? So once you have it like that, then I just put a little excess flour down on the board, and I just roll my rod around in that, and then I just kind of wipe that dough through it. And I stick the rod kind of like at an angle and wrap that end around. And then just gently, see, go around this, kind of keeping it on an angle, but not putting too much pressure on it. So let me do that again for you. So this, will, this amount of dough is going to make at least, I would say about 3 quarters of a pound. And that's enough really to serve four people. Let me get a different piece here. That one is a little dry. All right, so again, we're going under the palms of our hands. You can make these as long or as short as you want them to be. But it's very, very stretchy. And all this is is the durum flour and salt and water. There's no egg in this. The egg, that would mean it would be fresh pasta, is more in the tradition of northern Italy than southern Italy. Again, we just kind of put our rod there and in the, in the flour, and we wrap that just loosely around. Again, if it comes apart, just put it right back over there. I know it seems fussy, but I tell you, it's really delicious when you put the sauce on with this. And then, you see? So here's a whole tray. That isn't even half the amount of dough that I use, but here they are. You can make them ahead of time and make your sauce, and then you can cook them. You, this is best to cook the day that you make them because when they dry, they become very, very hard. And then they really don't cook very well. So you really have to cook them the day that you make them. And as you make them, keep them covered so that they don't get a gray cast over them. But that's the way they look. So get out that busso and start making this busiate pasta. So we have the busiate pasta that we made. Remember I told you this is a very particular pasta from around Trapani. And so the sauce that goes with it is called pesto alla trapanese. So it's pesto in the style of Trapani, the city of Trapani. Now, maybe you know that Trapani is very famous for sale, salt. A lot of the salt pans are right there on the western coast of Sicily. And so today I'm actually using some sea salt from Trapani, but you can use just regular salt. And for the pesto alla trapanese, besides the salt, you need cherry tomatoes. 
So here are some cherry tomatoes. These are not the exact cherry tomatoes that you would use if you were in Trapani. You would use something more like a pianolo cherry tomato, which is a smaller cherry tomato than this and it has a little pointed end. So our tomatoes are a little different, but we're using cherry tomatoes, whatever cherry tomatoes you can get. And if you have a garden, that's even better. And then to make the pesto, we also need almonds because almond trees grow profusely in Sicily. In February, if you go to Sicily, you see the beautiful almond trees are flowering. And so almonds are used in lots of lots of ways in Sicilian cooking, in regular cooking and cooking for pastries and in making this sauce called pesto alla trapanese. Then we need garlic, some fresh garlic, and then we need some fresh basil. So here we have fresh basil leaves. So how does this go together? Well, the first thing you have to do is deal with the tomatoes. So there are several ways to do this because you have to take the skins off the tomatoes. So what I do is I just take all the tomatoes, wash and dry them. You need about eight to 10 large tomato, large cherry tomatoes. These are, these are big cherry tomatoes. And you can either put them in boiling water and let them boil for a minute or two until the skin looks like this, you see? And then you can just peel the tomato, the uh, skin off the tomato, and you have the whole tomato. That's one way to do it. The next thing you need to do is cut those cherry tomatoes coarsely. So to do it, I use a tomato knife. See, let me show you in a just a non-cooked tomato, how easily that cuts a tomato without tearing it. It gives you just nice cuts. It has that serrated edge. So you really should use a knife like this as opposed to using something like this, which is hard to get through the skin. So once you have your tomatoes all peeled like that, then you just want to put them on a board and just coarsely chop them. And I think that this just makes the best sauce because this is really an uncooked sauce. You're gonna cook the pasta and you're gonna put this sauce over it at room temperature so you don't even have to cook this. But you wanna start with really, really good tomatoes because as I'm coarsely chopping this, I didn't tell you, we also have to put this through a mortar and a pestle or you could make this entire sauce in a food processor. So let me scoop them up, put them into a bowl, and set them aside. Okay, let me clean off my board. All right, we have our tomatoes, and now we have to deal with the almonds. So you want a half a cup of natural almonds, raw almonds, almonds without salt. And we have to crush those up. So you put them in a little processor and grind them. Let me see what we got. Okay, that looks good. So we're gonna put that into a bowl. So there are our almonds. We can just set this aside now because we don't need that. Now we get into the fun part. We have our almonds, tomatoes. We're going to need some extra virgin olive oil. We have the salt and the basil and the garlic. So we want to put the garlic into the mortar. This is the mortar. This is the pestle. It means to pound down. See? Now you're saying, she's got to be crazy to do this. Well, you know, I'm trying to do this, show you the traditional way of doing this. So you smash down the garlic a little bit. You give it a little bit of salt. Now the salt acts as an abrasive against the bowl, so you get an opportunity to use the pestle to really grind the ingredients. Now this is not a smooth sauce, it's a coarse sauce. So I got a little salt in there. And now you add the almonds. So you've got the almonds in there. And you just want to move that around a little bit with the garlic. And you 
know, this is, it's time consuming, but really it makes a very delicious sauce. So now at this point, once you have gone around it a couple times, then you want to start adding your tomatoes. So the tomatoes go in just like that. Remember, if you're not using this, you're doing this in a food processor, and now you are smashing down these tomatoes. You want to smash them down really well. I mean, you, you know, leave a little texture, but you really want to get them, get them going. When I first had this dish in Tropany, I was just so startled by the fact that, you know, most people think of pesto as something that's just made with basil, olive oil, garlic, and some cheese. Well, yes, if you're in Liguria, which is the northern region of Italy. But here in Tropany, their pesto is made with this. Tomatoes and the almonds that are grown right there. And of course, the tomatoes are very, very sweet in Sicily. So you can see it's getting kind of mushy now. So now we stop and we pick our basil leaves. So here's a little tip. Even if you're making a pesto, just a regular basil pesto, don't start with the big leaves. <laughs> start with the tiny leaves because they're a lot easier to work with. So you want, mm, you need about eight to 10 leaves. So this is fresh basil from the garden. Actually, this is from my friend Donatia's garden. Her husband grew this, but I have basil in the garden too. So you want to pick the small leaves, and it smells delicious. So I just break it up a little bit before you put it in there. Okay? Just tear it up. You don't want to cut it with anything because it bruises the basil. It's better to tear the leaves. Now, if you don't have small leaf basil, well, then you're using large leaves. It just means that you're going to work a little harder, that's all. But I, I got smart a long time ago, and I thought, why am I killing my arms? I'm going to use the smallest basil I can find because that's how they do it in Genoa. All right, I think that's enough. Okay, now we're going to add about a couple tablespoons of olive oil. And I'm going to do that a little at a time, so I'm just going to eyeball this. That's about a tablespoon. And really use a good extra virgin olive oil. Ideally, it would be nice if we had an olive oil from Sicily. And you can find them in your store, in your grocery store, or, you know, an Italian uh, a grocery store. You could buy it online, or you could just use a regular good all-purpose olive oil. So you see how, how saucy that's becoming, but it has a, a lot of texture to it. So I'm going to just put a little bit more, another tablespoon of olive oil and continue with this. And I wish you could be here because it really smells nice. It smells like a good basil sauce. Okay, that looks good. Let me get a spoon and show you. So here's the consistency, you see? It's still got some texture to it. It's not soupy, soupy falling off the spoon. And this is going to be the sauce for the busiate. So now you know why we made the busiate the way it's made. It has all those little grooves so that this sauce is really going to cling to that pasta. So now that we have the sauce, we can cook the busiate. So the water is boiling, and now we need to add some salt. You always want to add salt. So again, I'm using that salt from Tropany. You want about a tablespoon of salt for every pound of dried pasta that you make. Because pasta without salt is tasteless. So make sure the water is really boiling. Now here are the busiate. They're all ready to go, and I'm going to take them and put them right into the boiling water. Now this isn't going to take very long. Fresh pasta cooks in a very few minutes. And what you want here is to cook the pasta until it is al dente. Everybody always gets confused by that. And al dente simply means that the pasta is really cooked through. And a good way to check 
is to take a piece of the pasta, fish it out of the water while it's cooking, break it in half and look to see if there's any uncooked flour, white flour in the center. And if there is, well then you know you have to throw it back in the water and let it cook until there is no more white flour. That will give you a cooked pasta that is not mushy because most pastas are usually overcooked. So we want to allow the water here to come back to the boil. And if you look in the pot, you can see that the busiate have swelled up some. So they've kind of absorbed a lot of that water. So once they bob to the top, in about two minutes, I'm going to be able to take them out. And I just don't dump them in a strainer in the sink. Look at how beautiful they are. I drain off that water, put them in a bowl. You see how beautiful they are? They're so cute. They're a little slippery too, but that's okay. Now that water has starch, so oftentimes you will add that to whatever sauce you're making. But for this sauce, we don't need it because we've got those tomatoes and they're a little juicy, so we don't want to add too much extra liquid, okay? So here they are, and we're gonna sauce them now with some of this beautiful trapanese pesto. Look at that. Put that right over the pasta. Not too much, you just want enough to coat the pasta. And it's del these are delicate, so do that gently. I mean, you can add as much sauce as you want, but I think you should be able to see the pasta that you're eating. And it's just got a nice, profumey flavor. And you see, we didn't have to cook this sauce. This is a raw sauce. You could add a few raw tomatoes to it if you wanted to. And then with this, we need to add some Pecorino Romano cheese. This is Pecorino Romano. Pecorino, the word means sheep. This is sheep's milk cheese. And this is DOP, Pecorino Romano DOP. Means that this cheese can only be made in certain areas, like Lazio, Sardinia, and Tuscany. And the cheese making process has to fi fi follow certain rules. So we want to add some Pecorino Romano cheese to this. It's a salty cheese. So you want to control the amount of salt that you're adding. Looks beautiful. I'm going to add just a tad more of this sauce. And you can imagine now the nice textural taste that you're going to get with this because you've got the, the almonds, you've got the tomatoes. We're all set to eat it. So you want to take it. and plate it. Get the rest of that. Beautiful. Now you know that a cup of cooked pasta, any kind of pasta, is a serving, right? So you're not eating a whole pound of pasta. So then I think we should just dress this up with a few basil leaves. And there you have it, the classic homemade busiata pasta made with pesto alla trapanese. Today I took you on a little trip to Trapani, Sicily where they make a particular pasta called busiate. Remember, we made that around a form, the kind given to me by my friend, Terry Murray. And we topped the busiate with a pesto alla trapanese. Remember, that was made with cherry tomatoes, with almonds, with olive oil, with basil. And now we're going to top the dish with a sprinkling of pecorino romano cheese. And until I see you Nella Cucina again, I'm Mariana Esposito. Ciao.